Hello and welcome everybody to this discussion about the opportunities for banks and wealth managers to rewire the system of financial advice. I'm Maya Tisviller, CEO of the UBS Optimist Foundation. For those of you who don't know us, the UBS Optimist Foundation connects clients with impactful programs, leveraging flexible philanthropic capital to enable more profitable outcomes for people and planet. I'm really excited that today during our session, we'll be exploring what an impact economy is, what it will take to get it fully functioning, and who can help drive results and innovation. And to discuss this and a lot more, I'm really delighted to welcome some of the people and organizations that are thinking hard about these questions. With me today are Sir Parsa Sarathi Duskupta, economist and Frank Ramsey, Professor Emeritus of Economics at the University of Cambridge, Nicole Sykes, Director of Policy and Communications at Pro Bono Economics, and Alejandro Lito founder and CEO of Earth Security. But maybe just a few things before we begin. Uh, so first of all, the chat, feel free to use it. It's on the right-hand side of your screen. Uh, post any questions that you would like to uh, ask towards the end of our session. And you can also join the conversation on Twitter. You can see here the links at the bottom of the page. Then uh, next, um, everyone is welcome to subscribe to Alliance. Um, so there's a 50% discount, and you can see here the code on your screen as well. So now let's start uh, with the discussion. I'm, I'm delighted to welcome and introduce our first panelist, Sir Partha Dasgupta. Um, as I mentioned, he's the Frank Ramsey Professor Emeritus of Economics at the University of Cambridge. Uh, Dr. Dasgupta has published extensively about the role of the natural environment and this concept of inclusive wealth, uh, which we look forward to really finding out more about and how it relates to our discussion for today, focused on the impact economy. So over to you, Sir Parsa. Well, thank you very much. It's a pleasure to be here. I'll simplify things by thinking of the impact economy as being one in which the global demand um, Humanity, the global uh, humanity makes of the biosphere's services, goods and services, and I don't mean simply the provisioning goods, but also maintaining, maintain, maintenance and regulating services such as decomposition of waste, carbon regulation, and so forth. There are a multitude of those, so that the global demand for them uh, does not exceed nature's ability to supply them on a sustainable basis. A sustainable basis is key here because it means that we don't eat further into nature in order to meet our demands. So that's what I'm going to be the target, if you like, is of our, at least my discussion. Now, there are three classes of uh, agents, agencies that we might want to think about, and I'll, I'll concentrate on them. The first of all, the shareholders of, of, of and, and, and they, their motivation may be uh, the return they get from their investment in various shares, um, but also their, their, their citizens as well. So they may want to marry that interest uh, with, with their concern about the biosphere, the fact that there is a huge overshoot at the moment. We, our demand exceeds sustainable supply of uh, nature's goods and services. The second uh, category of agents would be companies themselves, um, CEOs, let us say, just for the sake of argument. I'm going to be making a stylized and obviously superficial classification, but it helps, okay? And I like to imagine that their interest is profitability, uh, as market profitability in their investments, the projects they accept. And then there's the state, and we like to think of the state as representing, uh, defending the common good something like the common good of this industry. Uh, and they'll be particularly interested in distributional issues because the common currency of thought uh, is that markets can handle the efficiency side of things, That's ensuring that resources are allocated efficiently, but markets don't handle distribution well. Uh, so that's where the state comes in. So the common good is to be thought comprehensively. Now, the way uh, political science and economics has developed over the past century or so has been to, there are differences of opinion, goes without saying, but broadly speaking, the idea has been that these are 
separate terrains of interest, and they are not necessarily um, in, in, in harmony with one another. And hence, for example, the idea that the companies are particularly interested in the state laying off, re removing regulations and so forth, because otherwise uh, there'll be a lot of wastage in resource allocation. I want to argue that the, new, the world we now have inherited, where the demand for nature's uh, goods and services far exceeds her ability to supply them on a sustainable basis. By the way, the ratio has been estimated to be about 1.7, 1.8. So we're looking at a serious overshoot in our demand. That, that this, this imbalance has created a world in which perhaps the language needs to change enormously, where the language requires to move in a direction where uh, companies actually work in harness with the state, as opposed to thinking that there are, in some sense, conflict uh, between the motivations are different, and that in some sense, the state has a stranglehold over um, the aims and intentions of companies. Freeing markets, if you like, uh, is, 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 an, is their own call. And I want to argue in a minute as to why there needs to be it will be in the self-interest of shareholders, companies, and the state to marry their interests and be explicit and, in, and, and cooperate in a very uh, uh, in a in a, um, in a uh, visible way. Now, one reason, and I'll, I'll concentrate on that reason only. There are others. Uh, is that at least the G7 countries, the rich countries, let me call them the rich countries have essentially outsourced their demand for primary goods. The, uh, it's not, a, it's not an uh, accident that the greatest biodiversity happens to be in the tropics and the world's poorest countries also happen to be in the tropics. That's not an accident, not a coincidence. They're the suppliers of primary goods. So uh, what you think of this model in which you have in mind, primary goods are at the top end of the supply chain of the company. And of course, the finished product goes into our supermarkets or wherever in the UK or, or wherever. Now that creates problems because another, another feature of ecosystems is of course that they are hugely correlated with one another. What happens to one ecosystem, it's let's say grace, a, a wetland affects the farms nearby. And what happens in the farms nearby affects the, uh, the, the, the productivity of the, of the wetland. Now this, Correlation means that the decay of ecosystem through overuse, which is, I've started with the idea that there is an over, overshoot. And the way that overshoot impinges itself is deterioration of ecosystems from which primary products are imported. That causes fluctuations, or if you like, greater uncertainty in the profitability of the enterprises that the companies are interested in. How do you re reduce that risk? That risk is correlated with ecological risk. That's the point I'm trying to make. It, it, ecological risk translates itself into profitable risks in profits of the importing country. You can't ensure that risk away because of the correlation, because of the positive correlation. Moreover, there are moral hazard and adverse selection problems all along the long supply chain from source to the final product in the supermarkets. One way of solving that, resolving that problem, because markets can't be created because moral hazard is moral hazard is moral hazard. It has to be done through some other means. And one way would be for disclosure of what's happening in the entire, along the whole, entire uh, supply chain. It's in the interest of the company because in some sense it binds the company into doing something about the source where the, the ecosystem from which the supply is being uh, is being, uh, is being, being obtained, obtained. The problem is because of this correlation of, supplies, of, of the supplies in the import, exporting country, uh, no firm on its own wish, will wish to do that because you may be the first, you may say, all right, I'm going to be a moral, ethical uh, firm and I'm going to spend a lot of money in rehabilitating the ecosystem from which I draw my inputs. But others are going to benefit. A competing firm which happens to import from a neighboring ecosystem will be benefiting and therefore there'll be lesser incentives to do that. So here's again a 
a possibility of cooperation, a cooperation which will enhance the profitability of the companies themselves because the risk will be reduced thereby. One way they can get that done is to have the state insist on disclosure. The way states do now over food, the food we eat, why do firms disclose the food content? Because a moral hazard adverse selection problems. The consumer doesn't know what he's buying or she's buying, and she cares about her health. So she said, I want to know what I'm eating. And that's now being, and that's all, that's why all the information that's available on the food product is supplied. So it seems to me this is one area where some serious thought could be given as to how companies could work with the, the with the state and therefore the shareholder. Of course, you want need to get some sense from the shareholders. Some of the prompting may come from the shareholders themselves. They might say, I'm not going to invest in your company because you treat the ecosystems out there badly. Okay, well, that's a nice situation where you, you really have it in your interest to, the, I mean, the company has it in, in its interest to make the disclosure. But if not, there's a risk that the, the first mover will lose. And hence, I'm suggesting that we perhaps ought to change the way we think of political economy now and political science by suggesting that these three categories of people, uh, or, of agents, are not, um, if you like, antagonistic in any sense. There are huge gains to be had from cooperation uh, in, for, for each of the participants. I'll stop there now and begin. Thank you very much. Um, maybe a follow-up question for you, and, and you mentioned a lot about gains from cooperation. Um, how do you think we could get to a point where on a bigger scale, we see individual investments that are actually aligned with this concept of cooperation or your concept of inclusive wealth? Well, the inclusive wealth, of course, is, a, is the right thing to go for, for, uh, for informing uh, everybody about the states of the economy. We think of GNP as GDP as being the signal, but that's a complete rubbish one to use because GDP does not take account at all. It does not disclose, if you like, since I'm using the word disclosure in a big way here, mm -hmm. uh, depreciation of assets. So you could have GDP growing like crazy as we have been enjoying over the past 70 years, in globally at least, and certainly among the richer countries, even while natural capital, mother nature goes diving down. That's happening, but GDP is not going to record that. So that's rubbish. That goes on saying it has no business to be a signal of, uh, of long-term economic health. Long-term economic health is inclusive wealth. It's like the wealth of nations. You want to look at your assets just as companies do when they produce balance sheets. Nations don't produce balance sheets. And what inclusive wealth does is to say that you should try and value as much as you can all the capital assets that you have, not just produced capital, human capital, which is now conventional practice, but natural capital too. And that's beginning to become now commonplace. The UK has, the ONS, the Office of National Statistics in the UK is launching uh, natural capital accounts. Chile is about to is about to start. Uh, they established a natural capital committee only last month. Uh, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Costa Rica has, and there are several other countries which are in that move. I think that move is happening. But remember, what natural capital does is to give you an informed picture of where the economy lies, what's happening to the economy over time, as to what the asset structure is. What we're discussing here, at least what I'm discussing here, is what do we take out from there, that fact to action in terms of policy and uh, what where the investment ought to go. And the way I've been trying to sketch it here, and this full account of it is in my review of the, the uh, economics of biodiversity that I produced for the UK government. Mm -hmm. so, uh, it's basically saying that if we do that, then it will be aligned with the idea of inclusive wealth increase. That's the idea. Great, fantastic. Well, I, I look forward to coming back at the end of the, the session on this this whole idea of how do we move beyond GDP as a measure and move to measures around inclusive uh, wealth. So thank you for that. And for everybody that's listening to us, please start thinking about questions for, for the panel. We'll come back to the end for a, for a, a more lively Q&A with everybody.
Um, but first, uh, our next panelist, and I'm delighted to introduce and welcome Alejandro Litovsky, the founder and CEO of Earth Security, um, which he started in 2011 to redesign how global investment decisions across asset classes could incorporate environmental data more effectively to address critical planetary resource trends. So I'm going to hand over now to Alejandro on, on how you see the ecosystem evolving and how we can work all together to co-create solutions for an impact economy. So over to you, Alejandro. Thank you, Maya. Uh, thank you very much. And, and, and thank you for to Alliance Magazine. Look, let, let me maybe just start um, by, by sharing. I recently saw this, this cartoon of, of an investment boardroom um, at, where, where they were projecting, you know, uh, this slide on, on forests and said, if all the trees in the world were able to emit a Wi-Fi signal, we would be able to unlock finance for reforestation on a global scale. And then underneath it said, too bad, they only produce the oxygen we breathe. Right, and so I think that this this illustrates I think the par the, the paradox we're in at the moment. Just to build on Sir Path does Gupta's, Gupta's really great point, that we are at this difficult juncture where we know the value that the planet's ecosystems provide to us as a species. We know that without them we cannot survive, but we don't yet have those off-the-shelf scalable investment products that can help have a positive impact on these systems. Uh, and that can allow the scalability just by, by, by um, uh, you know, pro providing sort of instruments that are ready to be deployed. So we're still, in many ways, despite all the innovation happening in this ecosystem, uh, in the social financing ecosystem, I mean, we're still accelerating towards overshoot. And I think that that's the worrying point. So we at Earth Security, we're focusing on, on incubating, you know, those impact investment practical opportunities that can consider nature as an asset, so to speak. Now, what, what do I mean by that? You know, we're looking at and measuring the services of ecosystems, drawing as much as we can on existing peer-reviewed science, looking at forests, looking at mangroves, looking at uh, oceans, through the lens of the security that they're providing to countries and economies, hence putting earth and security together. Um, and we are beginning to therefore identify the business models the value chains for key commodities, the manufacturing enterprises that need to be winners in that economy that best build around impact. And that, and that starts to provide a clue very practically and say, so how, how do we think about what banks and asset managers need to do when supporting an impact economy that it's starting to integrate those values into their investments? But how? How, how are they going to do it? You know, and how some of the list, listeners today, I think, and, and the recording, I think, will resonate with this. I think it's very important to say first that by positive impact, at least I don't mean ESG considerations, right? ESG tends to be, I would say, about doing no harm, making sure that companies have certain safeguards. But it doesn't necessarily tell us much about what is the transformational effect of those investments. And so, therefore, by, by positive impact, uh, I mean the actual effect on the preservation or the restoration of these ecological systems through the companies that we are investing in. And so therefore, I think a useful benchmark to have for the so-called impact economy investments is to be able to make sure that they're supporting business models and companies that are regenerating rather than degenerating nature's flows and, and services. Uh, and that we are doing so in more inclusive ways as well that are increasing dignity of workers and social well-being, including, you know, other overdue issues like putting women much more at the center of decision-making power. And these things, yes, we may feel they're social, but I think we've moved beyond that notion that ecological issues are on one hand and social or governance issues are on the other. And we need to start to think much more systemically about these opportunities. Now, I would say the, those models already exist, but they tend to be so niche and so small and so marginal to the way in which economies work uh, and also the way in which asset managers and banks, and, and, and here I mean the, uh, the, the fund managers that are actually uh, mobilizing the, the, the commercial investments of these institutions are, are, are looking at. So uh, one practical example, you know, of a program that we're working on and you wouldn't know this, Maya, because you know UBS Optimus Foundation is one of our our partners, amongst others. 
is focusing on, on cloud forests. Now, um, let me spend one minute on this. You know, for those of you that don't know what cloud forests are, these are tropical forests between 1,500 and 3,000 meters of altitude. They're sitting on top the, the mountains across the tropical region of the planet. Now, what these forests do, which is pretty mind blowing, is that they capture moisture from the clouds and they send it downstream um, rivers as water. Now, there's up to 60% more water flowing in those rivers uh, because these highly threatened forests are performing an incredible ecological function. Now, we, we've just published a, a blueprint of how to integrate that in investment, but what we're doing now is we're working in Colombia, which is one of the most biodiverse countries in the world, to design what we're calling a cloud forest bond, in which we can figure out ways to get those industries that are benefiting from the water that is flowing from these forests to pay through biodiversity credits to sustain a range of services, the water flow, the storage of carbon, and so on and so forth. But we're also working on uh, a range of coffee investments. And now coffee production is one of the big drivers of deforestation of cloud forests. Since farmers, because of climate change, need to start to go up here to keep uh, the temperature down on those crops. And as they do that, they become the frontier for deforestation. Now we're identifying and facilitating investments in what is called shade-grown coffee. And this is a proven production model. In fact, it's how coffee was cultivated before the, you know, a monocrop sort of, uh, sort of larger scale uh, system was put in place. And the crops are cultivated within the forest. They protect biodiversity, they provide livelihoods with a premium price for coffee for local communities. Now I've spent a little bit of time on this because now imagine for a second how amazing it would be if when you stop at a Starbucks in London or New York or wherever you are, uh, you could ask for a cloud coffee, knowing that as you sip from that cup, you are helping sustain these vital forests in the tropics. So I say this because, you know, nature is not just about carbon sequestration. And this is, I think, the way in which markets have picked up the opportunity. But it's much more than that. It's essentially about how we use and exploit resources. Uh, and how ultimately this links back to consumers in, in new and different ways. And, and, and I'm very glad, you know, I, I was very glad to hear uh, uh, Sir Partha talk about the consumer angle as well. Now, uh, you know, just to finish, I'd say that both a cloud forest bond, which starts to create a fixed income product that starts to sound more familiar for asset managers that they know where to put the product, as well as regenerative coffee investments, they represent the type of I would say financial products and funds that need to be tried, tested, and mainstreamed at a bigger scale to make, make an impact economy uh, a, a new reality. Let me, let me sort of stop there, Maya, and then we can sort of play it into the, the Q&A uh, later on. Thank you. I think you, you're muted. Maya, you're muted. Maya, your your mic is muted. Oh, sorry. Thank you. Um, I was just saying thank you so much for that. And and what, two of the things that I picked up in, in in what you said were we need to start supporting businesses and investments that are regenerating ecosystems and doing that more inclusively. But on the other hand, you also said they're still quite niche and small. So what do you think are some of the current barriers to co-creating some of those solutions and beyond the financial industry that obviously has a role to play, what are some of the other um, players that you think um, can maybe adapt faster uh, to try and help co-create these solutions? Yeah, well, look, I would say uh, from the barriers perspective, let me, maybe I'll focus on one and then we can, we can continue expanding that in, in the discussion. But I would say there is something about these models that do not necessarily conform to the usual way of doing things in certain industries. And so, you know, hydropower dams, we recently looked at that. Uh, they need to be restoring forests upstream in order to maintain water flows into the future. But it so happens that the engineering mentality with which dams are built uh, is just, it's not very used to thinking about nature as an input or as an asset of that production system. And so naturally, we don't know enough about how to prove and convince, you know, many of these uh, uh, it's perhaps a cultural change as well, 
to start to integrate this into the investment equation. Now, and so therefore, these investments sometimes tend to be perceived as more risky. Now, that risk can be real in some cases, or it could be perceived. And, and therefore, we need blended finance, but by, by blended finance, I think we're probably all familiar with that concept, which is basically different layers of capital playing different roles, so that uh, when, you, when you have philanthropic or development money uh, coming in with uh, uh, you know, a first loss or a guarantee on a project, that ensures that from a private investment perspective, those investments will become a bit less risky and their appetite uh, uh, will become uh, larger. And so, you know, I would say when you look at nature related investments, uh, blended finance tends to be one of the most important tools to unlock some of these opportunities and make these more appealing to, to, to investors. Um, and then in terms of, um, you know, in terms of actors, I would say two things that to me, for me, uh, uh, you know, um, stick out as, as really big opportunities from a stakeholder perspective. One is the really important role of philanthropy. Um, and here, you know, we see on the one hand, uh, phil philanthropists working individually, even more powerful for philanthropists is when they work collectively um, and pull their capital to be able to do more. Now, what can they do and what are they doing? We see philanthropists de-risking many of these investments by providing the blended finance I was talking about. This is for grant funding for project preparation, guarantees for projects, even first loss investments, right, that are intended to be commercial but can be lost first if a project doesn't go well. Uh, and, of course, research and development, the kind of incubation that we're doing around, uh, around these projects is really important. And then, and then secondly, you know, government regulators play an absolutely fundamental role. As I think sort of back to, to Sir Parthas' Gupta's point, his review was, was, was very important, very influential, and in fact commit, commit, um, commissioned by the UK Treasury. So we can hear firsthand from him, maybe in the Q&A, what is the kind of impact that has had or that he would like that to have on treasuries. I'm, I'm familiar with the work that the central bank, the Monetary Authority of Singapore is doing, for example, in trying to build this into their policies. And then the last thing I'd say is, well, I'm Argentinian, even though I've spent almost the last 20 years in London. Now imagine for an agricultural sort of powerhouse like Argentina, what would happen if a Ministry of Agriculture uh, or, or the regulation of agricultural exports put a nature positive lens on, on, on you know, charging a, a, a smaller levy on those exports that are actually restoring nature from the farm perspective, that would be an absolute game changer, right? And, and this may be a little bit far from emerging markets like Argentina, but we're already seeing that uh, in the EU today with import policies that are aiming to ban uh, commodities that are linked to deforestation. And that's already happening. And of course, you have uh, countries like Indonesia, Malaysia that are protesting. So you can already see the geopolitics uh, that is going to uh, uh, be linked to some of these nature uh, transitions. But let me stop there. I think that, but just to say that governments, we tend to think about investors and asset managers. We tend to think about pipeline. That naturally takes us in the direction of a company we can invest in. And that's what we need to do from an investment perspective. But governments really hold uh, the key to, to unlocking the systemic change and changing the game together for what happens in their, in, within their territories. Yeah, thank you so much for that. And certainly a common thread here with what Sir Partha said, like how can we get a win-win to have that cooperation between actors um, if we really want to see this impact economy coming to life. And in terms of the role of philanthropy, I didn't tee you up for this, but obviously uh, at the UBS Optimus Foundation, we do see the important role of philanthropy and actually engaging philanthropists to come together as a, as a collective uh, to not only pool resources, but also do so in a more strategic way. Um, so thank you, and we'll come back to that in the discussion later today. But, but um, let me first introduce our last panelist, uh, Nicole Sykes, uh, Director of Policy and Communications at Pro Bono Economics. Uh, she joined Pro Bono Economics in August 2020 to work with policymakers, businesses, charities, and civil society in all its forms. So we really look forward to hearing from you, Nicole, on the role of banks and wealth managers in this impact economy and the trends that you're seeing. But before I hand over to Nicole, please remember to submit your questions in the chat, um, and we'll head into Q&A right after uh, Nicole's presentation. So now over to you, Nicole. Thank you. 
be familiar. And I feel like I've been set up quite well um, because uh, when, when sort of I sat down and asked myself around um, how banks and wealth managers can support that transition to an impact economy, uh, the philanthropic perspective is uh, absolutely where I've come from. And in particular, how uh, banks and wealth managers can offer great high quality advice on philanthropy and guidance on philanthropy to their clients. Now, I know in saying that, that that's not necessarily as simple uh, uh, as it sounds. Um, uh, I believe there's something like 23 different services which philanthropists could require on their giving journey through the needs of individuals differing on, on, on their different approaches from giving, from everything from charity due diligence to establishing giving vehicles to tax and legal advice through all the way to the end to assessing the impact after a donation has been made. Um, but offering, uh, but but the sector offering uh, greater volume uh, and greater quality philanthropy advice, I think, could be significantly advantageous, uh, and advantageous for uh, clients, for firms, and of course for society as a whole. Um, we haven't talked much yet um, uh, about why people would want their money uh, to go into the impact economy. Um, but I think uh, I'm sure many people on this call will recognize a huge and growing demand for money to do more good. Um, I think uh, sort of two benefits that I would uh, uh, pull out in particular um, is the demand coming from younger people. Um, younger people are more likely, millennials more likely than any other age group, to believe that actually that returns have to be sacrificed to generate social good, yet they are the most interested in sustainable investing. So they actually think, you know, we might have to give some of our money up to uh, ensure that the greatest good is being created with our money, but nevertheless, they are the most keen to do so. And uh, they're about 50% more likely, uh, under 34s are about 50% more likely uh, than over 55s to say that they have a responsibility to share their wealth. That's, that's high net worth individuals, young high net worth individuals feeling a responsibility and feeling a growing responsibility to share wealth uh, in, in a productive way. So there are absolutely um, uh, benefits for individuals from uh, uh, from giving from from the sector giving better and and more advice on philanthropy, but I think what's really important as well is that there are also benefits for firms for offering high quality philanthropy advice. Uh, I'm sure UBS uh, uh, see those themselves, um, uh, but those benefits kind of falling into uh, a couple of buckets. The first of which is around relationships. Offering high quality philanthropy advice can massively deepen relationships between firms and their clients and allow for a better service delivery as a result. Um, discussions around philanthropy allow firms to present a more sort of comprehensive and holistic approach to managing a client's wealth, but they also provide insights uh, uh, that help advisors to better serve their clients. When you talk to a client, about their philanthropy, you're really getting into the things that are very important to them, allows you to understand them better. And of course, they allow firms to demonstrate sort of a greater personal interest. But that actually can have real financial benefit for firms. Uh, research by Fidelity into some sort of the US market of, of investment advisors shows that those advisors offering charitable planning have significantly higher net promoter scores uh, than, than advisors that don't. Uh, looking at the firm level, uh, firms in the US that offer their clients some form of charitable planning have three times the median organic growth rate of those that don't, as well as 1.3 times the median new money per investor. So real bottom line benefits of offering philanthropy advice, charitable planning advice. And not only does it improve relationships, it also allows for the deepening of um, the relationship, not just with the holder of wealth, but with families. Um, I sort of talked briefly about um, uh, the importance of philanthropy to that younger generation, um, but I know that many uh, wealth advisors in particular do worry about when assets change generations. Um, research by EY has shown that firms typically lose 70 to 80% of assets when they change generations. But philanthropy can be a really effective tool for managing and engaging multiple generations in their financial planning. And again, research from the US has shown that um, 
heirs are more likely to stay with their benefactors advisors if they help with family planning. So we know, sorry, family philanthropy. Um, so we know that it has benefits for customers. We know that it has benefits for firms. Uh, and of course, um, uh, it has benefits for society. Even just asking clients about their philanthropic intentions can actually help drive up donations. Uh, we've got research from the legal sector, which shows that uh, if clients are asked about their uh, intentions to donate, they are twice as likely to do so. And that makes a lot of sense. Um, uh, almost all donations that are made to charity follow the act of being asked or being prompted. Um, and even advisors even just asking about philanthropic uh, intentions can in itself help drive up um, uh, philanthropy. Um, and if we look at sort of high earners in particular, and if we look at the benefit to society from potentially driving up uh, better philanthropy advice, um, we believe, uh, and sort of we've done calculations over at Pro Bono Economics, that show that if uh, if we just look at high earners, uh, the sort of top 1% of high earners in the UK, if all of those who are donating below 1% of their income raise their giving to that level, it could raise up to £1.4 billion a year for charities. That's just moving people up um, uh, to 1% of their income, which, which a proportion of uh, wealthy people in the UK do give each year, an extra £1.4 billion a year for charities. That would make an enormous difference. And I think particularly given uh, uh, where we are at this moment in time with our economy, with what's happening with society and with the challenges that charities are facing uh, with their financial resilience post-COVID, uh, that is a significant amount of money that is, is nothing to be uh, sniffed at. So um, uh, in very quick summary, um, Philanthropy advice, I think, has a huge role to play in this picture of, of, of how banks and wealth managers can support the transition to an impact economy. Uh, and doing so really does benefit uh, everyone involved, which is, is I would say, rarely the case um, uh, when it comes to changes that, that, that sectors can make. Um, yeah, Thank that's... you. Thank you very much, Nicole. I mean, from what I hear you say, it seems like it's the obvious thing to do. You mentioned it has benefits for customers, firms and society. So why aren't more banks doing it? What are some of the barriers uh, that are out there in, in stopping banks from embracing? Yeah, absolutely. I, I think we see a number of barriers um, uh, in this from sort of traditional mindsets and culture, uh, which can hold back um, uh, which can hold back change. Um, we do see a sort of lack of incentives that can exist within firms stopping things, but often it's about sort of poor understanding of products, poor understanding of, of sort of social value and social impact measurement, poor understanding of uh, tax incentives, all of it coming back to sort of people not understanding what are the benefits of offering this um, uh, customers and, 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 and to business. And I think a lot of that just comes down to education. Um, most uh, uh, most financial advisors uh, don't get any education uh, in their in their sort of formal training and qualifications on philanthropy. Um, they might have some when they when they join a firm if if a firm does have a philanthropy offering. Um, but I think there are a a limited number of firms that have really strong philanthropic offerings. It's it's. Uh, uh, it's been a feature perhaps of, of perhaps 20 or so of, 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 of the larger private banks for perhaps the last decade. Um, uh, so some might get some training, but actually not huge amounts outside of sort of a, a small core of, of, of private banks. Um, I think that's one of the things that, that we would like to change. Uh, Alandro mentioned the power of regulators earlier. Um, and actually the FCA has a significant role to play. It controls the curriculum that um, uh, all financial advisors have to pass through. Um, and there's currently no mention of, um, uh, of philanthropy in there, and, 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 and perhaps there should be. Great, thank you, Nicole. So I hear you say the lack of training and education as being one, one, one barrier there. So maybe something that we can come back to on the, in the Q&A. Um, so we are actually now going to start the Q&A. Uh, so just a reminder that if you haven't asked your question yet, 
please go ahead and share it in the chat and then we'll start uh, sharing those with our panelists as they as they come in. Um, but maybe just to, to get us started, um, maybe uh, with you, Sir Parsa, and, and we'd love to hear from you, Alejandro, as well. What do you think, how important is transparency of reporting um, in unlocking this private and institutional capital for the, for the impact economy? Maybe Sir Parsa, starting with you. I was suggesting that is rather strongly because uh, of the fact that it's one way of uh, um, not eliminating but reducing market failure. That is, it's a, a disclosure, an honest disclosure is among other good things. I'm, I'm now looking at it purely instrumentally. Uh, is a replacement, is if you like, a, a substitute for missing markets. And the missing market could be simply the externalities that are involved at the deep end of the supply chain, at the top end of the supply chain. And of course, all along the supply chain, uh, come on, the goods are being moved, shipped. How they're treated, what's happening along the way is not observable, that's easily observable. So that's why it's extremely important. I should say, to begin with, I mean, one thing we should bear in mind, if you were to read a textbook in economics back in, say, 20, 30 years ago, even as, as recently as that, you would find chapters on externalities coming right at the end. The entire mental framework that we have been uh, trained to have is one in which essentially externalities are an exception. And by externalities, I mean un, um, unrecorded, uh, un, 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 um, actions which have not been negotiated the consequences of which can bypass any form of negotiation. And the idea would be, of course, markets handle that, so much of those externalities, internalizing them through the price system. You, you pay for what you're getting. And externalities are when they essentially leak out. Now, the, the recent work and our experiences over our handling of Mother Nature has made it quite clear that externalities are not only not an exception, it's very much the rule. Otherwise, we wouldn't be here discussing the impact economy. That's precisely because we feel there is a huge amount of institutional failure that we are supporting simply because there is a lot of transactions, not just amongst ourselves, but with Mother Nature. She's not charging for anything, remember. She doesn't have a, 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 an exit counter uh, where we pay. So we're now in a situation where actually we are not paying for what we are consuming. Uh, and that mm -hmm. costs and, and so and, and that's causing this incredible disruption. And so the question is, how do you get that payment made or acknowledged and, their, uh, and the burden of that payment uh, paid? And much of what my remarks were designed to do that. Okay. Fantastic. And maybe I'll link it, link it to a question from, 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 our, um, from our audience, Alejandro, from, from Nikki Wilson, who's asking, well, how do we price it and how do we embed that into uh, some of these uh, financial products. So importance of disclosure, yes, but then how do we actually make sure that it's embedded and priced in to some of these financial products? Um, I don't know, um, Alejandro, if you have some initial thoughts around that. Yeah, absolutely. Well, thank you for that and for the question. Maybe the first thing to say, I guess, in relation to the, to the question is that reporting and transparency is not the same as pricing, right? So in order to price something, we need a slightly different process. Uh, of valuation and the transparency and the reporting is the ways in which we can communicate that and measure it. Um, and I think that is an, in, it, that's an important distinction. You know, I, I think to your, to your point, Maya, about reporting and transparency, I'd say uh, we are starting to see a backlash against sustainable investment, ESG, carbon markets. Everything is being put in the same bag, which I think is a bit of dangerous. And, and a lot of that is, is partly that lack of specificity, um, you know, around, around what is the impact we're measuring and how we communicate it. I'd say pr probably in three ways, you know, first, um, the, the, the ESG space is so untransparent to the point that, you know, you tend to discover later that you were investing in an ESG fund that had an oil company there and you would go, you know, what is the rationale for that? And, and I, you know, me as an individual investor, I, I actually I didn't want that. So I've been forced to do it, right? And, and I think that has a lot to do with, with, with a transparency point. 
the same is happening in many ways with with carbon markets and nature-based carbon, which has suffered in, in recent weeks enormous backlash, but basically because the the integrity, let's say, of, of those processes is not properly in place. Um, I'd say there is a need for data, of course, and, and, and there's a need for monitoring, but but also what is the way in which investors will report back to, to clients? You know, those formats are not fully developed either, uh, which, which I think is, is really quite uh, one, one of the big to-dos. But then finally, I'd say that the reporting and transparency is not only important for trust and confidence, but also uh, in order to drive innovation. You know, and much of what we look at from a outcomes financing or results-based financing perspectives where, you know, we were talking about the bond, uh, impact bonds uh, earlier, what impact bonds allow us to do, whether it's in the environmental or the social space, is, is to create an upfront payment that then gets repaid based on actual delivered performance. Now, that basic principle kind of works if that reporting mechanism is not in place, that shows me that actually there is performance taking place and that allows the triggering of payments, right? So I'm paying for, for outcomes. And in order to have all of that in place, we need that architecture, I think, of reporting and transparency. So, you know, I'd say it hits those different, all of these different layers, all the way from, from confidence and transparency, which without which this cannot prosper, but also all the way to, to the design of actual mechanisms that are actually based on the, the notion that you're paying for results. And therefore, we need that, we need that reporting cycle to work quite well uh, as part of the mechanism itself. Great, thank you. And then following up on that, maybe, um, what is, Sir Parsa, maybe back to you, what do you think is, is, is needed in order to enable that uh, disclosure to happen cons consistently? And what are your thoughts around um, standardization around that, that disclosure? Can you talk to us a little bit about maybe some of the progress that's been made in that regard? Standard, standardization, I could not comment on. It's far, far removed from my, my expertise. But I would, from the first part of your question, I would go for the, have an understanding of how it happened that food companies now disclose the content of the food we buy. Uh, how did that happen? 50 years ago, I didn't think it, that was customary. It's happened in large measure, I suppose, because customers wanted it. We were started worrying. We read articles about things we were eating, which didn't sound so good. Uh, they made them tasty, but they were also doing bad things to us. And we got worried about that over the years, I guess, over the decades. And what pressure on government, maybe, in, at least in these parts, this part of the world. So I think we need to understand that. But the key thing is that we really have to go beyond the, literally we have to overcome our natural language, the language we have inherited from the past regarding political science, the state of governance, the, the role of the state, the role of firms, the of companies, banks, in, individuals, and so forth. That really has to change because as I, as I, when I say it has to change, in line with the kinds of things that we are all three of us have been discussing here, because of the fact that now we, it's very commonplace to say we are in an integrated world. Substantially, what it amounts to is that now the world is no longer as modular as it used to be. And modularity is a technical term in mathematics, which basically says that we are evening out. So disturbances anywhere gets transmitted very fast elsewhere. Okay, that's. You don't have barriers which prevent that. Now, mm -hmm. the, the modularity, of course, has been caused by many things which are good, obviously, trade and so forth has been. But on the other hand, that's been taking place with an in intellectual insight which just does not recognize the fact that many of the consequences of our actions we are not paying for. No agent mm -hmm. is paying for it. And that accommodation needs to be reached. And everything we are discussing here is really built on that problem. Right, no, I absolutely agree. And, and maybe a last question from the audience uh, before we go to some um, concluding remarks. Maybe for, for you, Nicole, have you seen any examples of organizations doing it well or doing it right uh, that you, you could maybe share with, with the group? Yeah, that's, that's a great question. Um, I think 
I think doing it right depends on um uh depends a lot on firm structure it depends a lot on firm leadership I think where where I've seen firms doing it right um it's been shown that um uh, philanthropy is part of the firm's culture um where you also see perhaps engagement with staff on on uh, philanthropy as a priority uh uh where you also see um sort of uh, the organisations using uh, philanthropy as an opportunity to convene philanthropists and charities and seeing it as an engagement mechanism with their clients, uh, as well as just uh, uh, sort of a, a service that they offer. Um, it really does come from sort of leadership often being well educated and, and, and understanding this issue and seeing it as something that is part of the, the sort of offering that they create and making sure that you know I've seen some questions in the chat about sort of what's um uh, about sort of concerns over loss of assets under management and actually showing that there are different incentives that can be created for staff in order to prioritize philanthropy and I would say when philanthropy is really um sort of tied through so from the moment as a client you are uh, uh sort of uh having your first conversation with a relationship manager you are asked about philanthropy from the very beginning so that you can be either referred into a philanthropy team uh, or, or, or however else engaged as, as, as the organisation is set up. So I think it has to come from the leadership. I think it, uh, the leadership has to make sure that uh, incentives and, and, and things that might stop philanthropic advice being offered are removed. Um, and, and I think a big part of that is actually when the staff are also very, very involved in the philanthropy, but it, it does have to happen throughout the journey of, of the client within the organization. Yeah, thank you, Nicole. And I think one of the other questions that I saw is how how do you link up philanthropy with the, the rest of what the, the, the firm is offering? And so thinking about maybe that impact and, and financial spectrum. So, yes, philanthropy on the one hand, but then how do you bridge that with blended finance that um Alejandro was mentioning and, and then transition even that to, to impact investing and I think thinking about how do you price in that that impact into all the decisions whether that be on the philanthropic side or on the uh, on the more mainstream investment side um seems like uh, there there is a lot of of, of conversations going on and how to move in, into that direction so great, I think we have about five minutes left. So before we conclude, I'd love to just ask each panelist to give a very quick summary of your key takeaways uh, from, from today um, and, and, and concluding any concluding remarks. So we'll start with you, Sir Partha. Well, thank you very much. It's a pleasure listening to everybody. Um, I'm going to take a slight different slant by abstracting somewhat, by observing that one thing we, Extreme formwork externalities, which is the source of all the discussion we've had, are public goods. That is to say, you know, climate change, for example, is a public good in the sense that everybody feels it. You can't get out of it. You may the, the costs may be different for different types of people, but nevertheless, everybody's actually suffering from it or experiencing it, as the case might be. And that leads me to the observation that we, although we've been talking about cooperation amongst uh, various actors within an economy, we haven't really talked much about uh, at all, in fact, of international cooperation. And it seems to me a good example would be uh, subsidies, payments for the for the services the whole globe enjoys from the rainforests, uh, which uh, uh, Alessandro has been talking about. And one of the problems is of incentives. That is to say, a single country could say that we are housing the rainforest and that's the global public good but why the benefits we are enjoying sure but that's a fraction of the global benefits since others are enjoying it too so the incentives we have to protect it is lower than that of others question how that's a standard problem in public the question is what should we do about it i have seen nothing discussed on this in in the cop 26 or COP 27 but the natural thing would be for the global community to pay uh, for the services that these rainforests provide. They pay the countries because they're housing them. And as the law stands, it's sovereign, sovereign capital asset. If, you, if the rainforests are sitting in, 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 in Indonesia, then Indonesia has control over the rainforests. Okay. And so I think that's something that we ought to be talking about, these public goods. Then there are the oceans. The, 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 the oceans 
in the open seas beyond the 12 mile, mile limit. Now they're a global public good, but nobody owns it. And therefore everybody thinks that everybody owns it, but we ought to be charging for their, for their use. These you know, billions of pounds, dollars of uh, commodities that are trans, trans uh, you know, which, 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 which sailed across the seas, fishing and so forth. So we ought to have something like an international understanding of how to manage these global public goods, uh, taxing from one source and then subsidizing the for the the uh, rainforests, which, for example, are, are are public goods, but they're within within national jurisdiction. They pose different kinds of problems. I've seen no discussion of these matters in any of the COPs, and I think we need to do that urgently. Thank you. Yes, charging for the use of public goods. Um, over to you, Alejandro. Maybe that is a good segue uh, into uh, your public remarks. Yeah, absolutely. And, and thank you, Sibath. I think that that, that 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 I mean that is very powerful. And I mean, just just building on that, you know, we tend to look at these global ecosystems as, as what we call Earth assets. Uh, you know, provocatively, because we need to translate that to what what does that mean from an investment perspective. And I think one, one important takeaway for me from today uh, is the fact that when we think about impact investment or an impact economy, this is not the nice to have investments. It's actually rethinking, you know, mainstream investments into all the industries, which in a way are already causing the problem. I mean, when we talk about overshoot, we're not talking about a natural phenomenon, right? We're talking about the industrial civilization we've created actually not accounting for and everything between a fishing fleet, you know, uh, agricultural commodities, cattle, cities, you know, everything that constitutes uh, mainstream investment today needs to be thought through in terms of those, those limits and those boundaries. Um, uh, and not in terms of ESG, but actually in terms of positive transformation. And now that brings us to the second point, which, which you were raising, Maya, around uh, um, tr transparency and reporting. Uh, and why that is important? Well, because we don't know if we are doing well, you know, unless we have those metrics in place. Now, for me, one insight that comes out of today and, and the conversation between the three of us or four of us, um, to, to Sir Partha's sort of point around, ultimately, we're talking about a governance failure and a need to rethink governance. I think that also has an impact on how we think about what a successful reporting look like. Um, you know, you have impact reporting at the firm level today, where investors want to hear back from the company what, what positive impact it's had, if it's talking about five hectares, but we need to combine that with a reporting a government or a state needs to do in terms of all the hectares in that landscape. And I think that kind of integrated reporting is not, is not there yet, and, and that's a major opportunity for innovation. And then finally, to Nicole's point, and uh, you know, perhaps as a segue, I, I thought Nicole's point around how do we work at the incentive level uh, from from individual fund managers and you, you know the, the the sticks and carrots? I think that that's a whole uh, discussion that is really quite quite important to have uh, together with this more systemic conversation. And so uh, very glad, interested to hear more on that. But uh, thank you for thank you for the time. Thank you, Alejandro. Nicole, your concluding remarks. Absolutely. I mean, I'm really struck by Alejandro using the words integrated. And I think when I talked about the uh, benefits for customers, for firms and society when it came to um, greater philanthropic advice, I think it's also quite clear the action that's needed that is needed by is needed by every sector and it needs to be integrated action. We've sort of talked about the private sector, the public sector, the social sector, but also those communities in those forests who who uh, need to act in a certain way. Also, uh, uh, consumers, regulators, investors. Um, but I think what I find quite heartening is is there's quite a lot of practical action that we've talked about, as as, as well as sort of the the, the theory of it all um, that people can take. I guess the challenge, of course, is how global this is. Um, money operating globally, of course, and the challenges that we're facing uh, uh, also operating globally. Um, and, and how we actually reach the scale that is needed, I think is is the thing that sticks with me the most. Um, 
uh, that feels like our biggest challenge. How do we scale up the actions uh, uh, so that they really are driving the systemic change that we need? Thank you very much. I, I hope that all of you today have enjoyed the session as much as I did. Um, just a few takeaways from me. I feel like um, an impact economy that seeks to allocate all forms of capital more efficiently to provide more profitable outcomes for people and planet to meet humanity's current and future needs is possible, but it does need an integrated approach. Um, it cannot be driven by a single institution. It cannot be driven by, um, by government only. It cannot be driven by the financial sector alone. But certainly here at UBS, we believe in reimagining the power of investing to, to try and, and take us a little bit into that direction and making it a, a reality, whether that be um, innovating the role of, of the financial sector, but also looking at the role of philanthropy and UBS Optimus Foundation by providing patient and blended capital, by working collectively, and by partnering with government on um, how to change how public uh, money and regulation is, um, is, is being used. So with that, I'd like to extend a huge thank you to our wonderful panelists today for giving us their time. And um, most of all, I'll say thank you to all of us, all of you that were able to join um, for this really important conversation. So thank you to all of you. Um, the last thing that I'll mention is the next Alliance event will take place next week on February 22nd on transforming philanthropy. Um, and you'll receive a link uh, for a registration via email. So until then, thank you again. Uh, thanks for joining us and goodbye. Have a wonderful rest of your day. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you, man.